good evening to all of you and and let me take this an opportunity on behalf of shockwave and translumina to this exciting uh, calcium masterclass my name is ehsan raza i work as a general manager marketing and along with me i have i have happy to have my colleague from shockwave mr bhojraj tiwari who is a pdm india and along with that we we welcome you both to this great calcium masterclass which is a pinnacle of coronary intervention this is our season 2 in fact just few months back uh, last year we had the season 1 this is dedicated session on calcium for two days and this time we have interspersed our two days between this basically the whole idea of creating this great platform was basically as we move the disease landscape changes and more and more patients reports with calcium and basically as we move from the the conventional pci of wire balloon stent and the more complex cases comes this this is an opportunity and this is a platform where the spe with the speakers who comes are the masters of, of the game and they would like this is an opportunity where they share with the, their understanding and their um, aspects of the of the disease to many many uh, newcomers and and budding intervention cardiologist in the country and abroad and i can tell you today we have a powerhouse of speakers who are masters who are teachers of teachers today in this program who would who would take us to make us understand on what calcium and how one can really really treat this kind of challenges which is generally an acquiles of hill of of, of the of the intervention cardiologist so let me have uh, uh, before we go to the session and i hand over to the moderator of the evening i just would like to take few minutes to um, share about what does um, uh, translumina and shockwave do stands for as we all know about uh, shockwave as a an organization and at the same time we are their um, strategic partner basically as an organization today we incorporated in 2010 with more than 300 employees and all our products are c certified and with all our product generally are known for its uh, it it's efficacy and safety we are the only company in the world today perhaps to have the largest rct on stents for 10 years and we have a great great um a, a tie up with german heart center which is a, basically a paragon of excellence and more than our global footprints in most of the countries so we are happy to share with you the calcium master class we have host of speakers chair person very happy to have some of the finest craftsmen of of intervention cardiologists coming today so more as the session unfold we have some of the best speakers coming in today and talking about the disease and how to manage it and in order to take this session forward i am very privileged to have dr navin bhambri sir who is presently director and hod of the cardiology and max hospital shalimar bagh delhi just to give you a great introduction about him he has got lots of award and lot of best case presentations on various aspect on uh, the tenets of intervention cardiology and with a uh, multiple publications and its contribution in the fields of interven intervention cardiology sir i would like to hand over this evening to you which is going to be a very exciting sessions of people who are watching and for all of you sir who are are here, many of you are teachers of teachers who would be talking about uh, the 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 aspect of this disease so over to you navin sir for taking this session forward sir thank you asan thank you for the nice introduction uh, good evening am i am audible yes sir you yes sir yeah so good evening everyone uh, i want to welcome you all for this master class on calcium and it's my honor to be present among the esteemed faculty members i am the junior most whose experience will surely enrich us during the course of this uh, webinar and i am sure that all the presenters and the attendees will be richer in our understanding by the end of the program as we all know the calcified coronary lesion is a frequent problem in today's cath lab the presence of which increase the risk of peri procedural major adverse cardiovascular events and we can mitigate this risk the certain solutions like atherectomy devices cutting balloons scoring balloons ultra high pressure balloons and the new in our armamentarium is intravascular lithotripsy that is ivl so we will focus today on applications of ivl in the coronary calcium ivl can tackle certain unaddressed solutions we will see in today's program like deep thick calcium the role of ivl 
pain and bifurcation lesions, calcified osteal lesions, tortuous lesions. So it is a real pleasure for me to introduce our chairperson, Dr. Antonio Colombo, Dr. A. B. Mehta, and Dr. Hiremat. Dr. Colombo, he is the director of Cath Lab and Intervention Cardiology Unit in Milan, Italy. He is practicing intervention cardiology from last 30 years with a rich experience in all aspects of the coronary interventions, tower program, mitral interventions, left atrial appendage closure, and very various other structural procedures. Dr. A.B. Mehta, we all know Dr. Mehta is a veteran, renowned and respected cardiologist of Maharashtra. He, with more than 42 year experience behind him, he is the director of cardiology at Just Look Hospital and Research Center, Mumbai. Honored with various awards for his exemplary contribution in healthcare, including the Padma Shri Award. Dr. Hiremath, he is the director of Cath Lab, Ruby Hall, Pune, India. He received numerous awards from all over India and the world. He was the past president of CSI in the year 2019, 2017. And the panelists for today's session are Dr. Dr. Gopal Murugan from Chennai. He's a senior intervention cardiologist and electrophysiologist, director, tower and endovascular therapy at MGM Healthcare Chennai. Dr. Nitin Patki, who's a consultant cardiologist at Jupiter Hospital Pune. With uh, more than 30 years of experience, Dr. V. Rajashekhar, he is a senior intervention cardiologist and electrophysiologist at Yashoda Hospital, Secunderabad. Dr. Samir Dhani from Gujarat, he is director in the Department of Cardiology at Apollo Hospital, Gandhinagar. So without uh, wasting time, let's initiate the talk. And the first talk will be delivered by Dr. Antonio Colombo. He will discuss the clinical evidence matters. European experience of intravascular lithotripsy. So over to Dr. Colombo. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And uh, let me share my screen and uh, go with my presentation. It's coming. Yes, yes. Okay, do you see it's, now? It's awesome, sir. it's fine, it's, it's awesome. Sir. Okay. I don't know yeah. why, but uh, I got this funny message to, uh, uh, to, to share. You can this. go ahead, sir. You can go ahead. Okay. okay, but now, okay. So, sorry for this delay. So, CAD uh, pulled the destructive evidence to treat calcific lesions. I have no conflicts to disclose. Uh, as a background, we conducted many years ago the AVIO trial, which is the IVUS guarded PCI, and the investigators were not able to achieve optimal stand expansion despite high pressure balloon, despite rotational laterectomy, etc., in about 40% of the lesions. Um, we did not have many technologies, but we had, uh, as I said, uh, rotablation and high pressure balloon. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we did not achieve what we were supposed to achieve. Uh, the approach to classify lesion is a shock wave, as you know, but also high pressure balloon, rotablator, orbital atherectomy angioscalp, cutting balloon, and laser. But shockwave is a real newcomer with some unique attribute. And you will see uh, my, uh, my thinking regarding uh, this technology. Uh, let me first uh, devote uh, one slide at least uh, to the high pressure balloon. Uh, we all uh, know the high pressure balloon and the super high pressure balloon here is a case of uh, instant uh, restenosis with uh, uh, suboptimal stent expansion and uh, some uh, tissue proliferation. There are two stents here. Uh, and only with this OPN very high pressure balloon, we were able to expand these uh, underexpanded stent, reaching a reasonable cross-sectional area. As you can see here, there is no calcium, it's mainly fibrotic. And this is a, a limitation even for shockwave technology. Uh, so uh, 
you need a shock wave, but uh, you cannot solve all the problems with one technology. And sometimes as you will see, you need to combine various technologies. And with the high pressure balloon, we are able to reach 7.7. .7. One recommendation that we always make when we use uh, these uh, super high pressure balloons is to do IVUS because you need to be absolutely sure about the vessel size, otherwise you break vessels if you don't use this device appropriately. Sometimes you need to combine rotablation and high pressure balloon. Here is an example of a calcific lesion treated with rotablation 175. Uh, that uh, we needed to use uh, uh, high pressure balloon, but even with the high pressure balloon at 24 atmospheres, the balloon did not fully expand. And uh, uh, you see a consent, a, a 360 degree calcium with uh, only a fracture here. Uh, at this time, we did not have a shock wave, but this would have been a perfect case for shock wave. Uh, when the calcium is 360 degree, uh, this technology works uh, uh, perfectly. At that time, uh, we utilized the uh, cutting balloon at uh, 20 atmospheres. Uh, it's very important that we went up to 26. When you use cutting balloon at this very high pressure, make sure that uh, you take into account that the cutting balloon has compliance. So you really need to undersize the cutting balloon at least half a millimeter, otherwise you may rupture the vessel. Uh, with the cutting balloon at high pressure, you see from frame uh, panel one to two, the cutting balloon fully expanded from 26, 20 to 26 atmospheres and uh, the calcium was broken in another uh, segment and uh, this is sufficient to allow good stent expansion. And this is a very final result. So you see here, the need to combine various technology, rotablation, high pressure balloon, cutting balloon, and very high pressure uh, cutting balloon. Uh, at that time, we did not have the shock wave. The shock wave uh, uh, is well known to you, creates these uh, micro bubbles that have uh, a tremendous energy. People like to compare like 50, 60, 80 atmospheres, but it's really not a high pressure balloon. Uh, it's a micro, uh, micro bubbles that break the calcium uh, in a very focal uh, area. This is a typical example. This is a big vessel. In this vessel with a lot of calcium, uh, you can use rotational arterectomy, but in order to achieve a good result, you need to combine several bursts with the uh, price to pay of distal embolization uh, besides the complexity of the procedure. Uh, the OCT here shows, uh, you see the uh, very uh, diffuse distribution of calcium. Uh, look at again, uh, it between uh, uh, six and nine o'clock, uh, there is a big amount of calcium. Uh, we, uh, you see here in this uh, steel frame, in some aspect, the calcium is uh, distributed more than 180 degree. Uh, lesion preparation with the shock wave. If the shock wave does not cross, in this case, the shock wave crossed. But if the shock wave does not cross, uh, we are liberal to predilate the lesion, uh, at least sufficiently uh, to get the shock wave across the lesion. Here we use the 3.5 balloon inflated at four atmospheres. You can go up to six, but uh, we prefer to stay at uh, four atmospheres. You can do eight courses. Then after the shock wave, uh, eight sessions, uh, we almost always go with a high pressure balloon. Uh, in this case, we repeated, uh, uh, you see the uh, big uh, chunk of calcium uh, between uh, uh, 6 and uh, 12, and here near 6 p.m. 
uh, and after the shock wave, you see that there is uh, fractures uh, in various uh, segments. Uh, it's very important uh, to take into account that this procedure does not cause distal embolization, only fracture of the calcium. And this is a tremendous advantage because uh, add the safety to the procedure. So at this point, we almost always post dilate, but the post, the post dilatation after the shock wave is more benign because you are less likely to cause propagating dissection. If you cause the dissection, the dissection stays localized. We went with the 3.5 at 24 atmosphere. And here the lesion is well prepared. As a matter of fact, we did not implant yet the stent, but it's almost a stent-like result. Some people may even consider utilizing a drug coated balloon instead of implanting the stent, but uh, we used uh, a stent, a 3.5, post dilated 24 atmospheres with a very uh, excellent final result. Um, you know, these results, uh, uh, you see by OCT how circular is the stent morphology. You cannot achieve this result unless you utilize a calcium modifying technique like shockwave. Or you can use a rotablation, but you have to go up to 225, 25 bird, that is something undoable in 2022. So this is a big advantage of this technology. Here you see, uh, baseline, you see after the shock wave, after the high pressure in the stand balloon, uh, it's really remarkable how you can achieve uh, around the technology. Again, in the AVIO trial, 40% uh, of the time, despite uh, all uh, the high pressure balloon and the rotor pressure, we were not able. This is an, even an extreme example of an occluded stent where uh, we went uh, subintimal uh, behind the stent because we are not able uh, to open the stent uh, in the lumen of the stent. And uh, uh, this is all subintimal passage with uh, uh, gaining the true lumen uh, distally at the, at the crux. And uh, in the subintimal pace, uh, we did a shockwave balloon, a little bit undersized because you are subintimal and we are able uh, to fully expand the subintimal space. So this is an extreme case, but in some situations, as long as you take into account the uh, size of the subintimal space, you can use the shockwave in the subintimal space. Here the shock wave at three millimeter, not three point five, and then we did the twenty two atmospheres, and then uh, drug eluting stent. We repeated the shock wave because uh, we did not uh, like this uh, unround morphology. You see how asymmetric, and after repeating the shock wave and very high pressure balloon we were able to reach uh, this optimal morphology, which is around uh, with a OPN balloon, again, a little bit undersized because we are in the subintimal space uh, at 37 atmospheres. Uh, let me go to some uh, scientific data. Uh, the most representative study has been published in JAC 2020 with uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan Hill as the first author, 431 patients, and you see uh, the cumulative frequency of minimal lumen area, pre-procedure, post-intravascular lithotripsy and post-tent. You see how much you gain post-tent because the lesion has been well prepared. You gain, you can expand if the lesion is well prepared. And in order to prepare the lesion well in a calcific setting, you need to break the calcium. Uh, this uh, study uh, 
in dealing with complex lesion had a very uh, favorable short-term outcome. Cardiac death was 0.5. Uh, short-term myocardial infarction 7.3, which is a realistic number considering the type of lesions that were treated. You see this uh, example of the right coronary artery, how big lumen you can achieve and how you can achieve a round morphology. Uh, we looked at the one-year result of this study uh, with the uh, outcome in 384 patients, uh, 47 patients were excluded because they were the kind of the training group. And at one year, we had a mass rate of 13.8, cardiac death 1.1, MI of 10%, at 3.2 after 30 days, the stent thrombosis 1.1 and ischemia driven TLR of 6%, which is uh, very low considering the type of lesions uh, treated. So um, I like to conclude uh, saying that uh, intravascular lithotripsy is effective in severely calcified lesion, and the more circular is the calcium, the more effective the device. And I would like uh, to uh, listen to your experience when the calcium is not circular, when the calcium is nodular, because this is a particular situation where most of the devices are unsuccessful. Uh, adjunctive high pressure balloon is frequently needed, is not a must, but you should not be afraid to use a high pressure balloon after a, a shock wave and rotational aterectomy may be necessary for initial lesion crossing. Again, shockwave is not a substitute to rotablator, is a complement, especially when uh, you are treating uh, big vessels. And the most important, this device has a very high safety profile. The worst can happen, the device does not work, but very rarely, uh, you have complication due to the technology. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your outstanding presentation and amazing cases uh, using IVL. So I would like to ask one question, sir. <laughs> In your clinical practice, how often you're not able to cross the IVL balloon? I, I mean, I, I don't insist. If I cannot cross, I use uh, uh, rotablation if the lesion is very tight or I use uh, a, a, a balloon to prepare the lesion. So uh, in my experience, it never happened that I opened the shock wave and I was not able to utilize the device. Uh, I don't insist. If I have difficulty, I prepare the lesion well. And at the end, I always cross. How do you choose the shockwave balloon diameter? I mean, suppose the vessel is tapered, uh, broad at the beginning, and then uh, as it goes distally, it tapers. Uh, what kind of shockwave size should we choose? I use uh, the size appropriate to the area where I'm treating, uh, considering that you only go to four atmospheres, uh, even if uh, the balloon is a little bit oversized, you usually do not uh, uh, break the vessel at four atmospheres. So, but uh, uh, as you know, shockwave balloons are relatively short, so you can uh, be reasonably precise. But I use the shockwave based on the vessel size of the area that I'm treating. I think, uh, Dr. Colombo, it is um, the distance between the two emitters, which is the one which is important and not the balloon length. So I think, uh, Hiramath, uh, it is usually six millimeters, the distance between the two emitters. So I think tapering issue would not be in practicality of a materiality. Yeah, I agree. Tapering uh, is not uh, issue. An issue. We use the short balloons and uh, 
uh, again, if it's really a situation like that, uh, uh, you may inflate a tree atmosphere a little bit more conservative. Um, good evening, everyone. I think what Dr. Hiramat is uh, asking is that the distal vessel diameter is 2, 2.5, and he wants to use the same balloon in proximal LED, which is 3.5. So, and the vessel is uniformly diseased. Uh, so, what size diameter should ideally be chosen? Am I right, sir? Yeah, something uh, to this effect, yes. You know, Thank you. I mean, uh, to be precise, uh, uh, I, I don't know the effect uh, of a 3.5 balloon inflated at two atmospheres in a 2.5 vessel. I guess uh, the instruction for use don't tell you to do that. So if the vessel is really so small, you may have to use two balloons, one for the small distal vessel and one for the big proximal vessel. So. This is not frequent, uh, it's, uh, but uh, as you know, may occur. I, I, if I may be permitted, sir, the um, basic premise of the IVL is that uh, the balloon has to hug the vessel wall for the therapy to be delivered. So I have seen a lot of operators go by the distal vessel size diameter. So if the distal vessel is 3.5, if the disease segment is very small and tight and they've just created a passage and now if they put a 3.5 the balloon elongates at four to four atmospheres and now elongation of the balloon brings the bal balloon, uh, the fabric of the balloon closer to the emitters which are hot and they report a lot of balloon ruptures in my personal use i have always considered that if the balloon has to hug well and if i'm going in a very tight segment i 2.53 is max. I have gone in tighter segments. And at four atmospheres, I've cracked the because the basic purpose of the balloon is to send the shock waves and crack the calcium. Thereafter, you can use bigger balloons and balloon as per the distal reference diameter and treat the disease uh, segment. So the problem with oversized balloons, we are not worried about dissections because it's very low atmospheric pressures at which we are going. The problem with the oversized balloon is elongation of the balloon and bringing the balloon fabric closer to the emitters, which are hot. It is only because of this that we have a gap after these pulses have been delivered and the, um, the amber light turns green so that it cools off a little. Maybe yeah, wrong we, used, anyway. uh, we used to go frequently at six atmospheres also. And nowadays, we rarely go to six atmospheres. We stay at four. Uh, because if you use more frequently six atmospheres, you have more balloon ruptures. So we stay at four, and uh, as I said, uh, we are very liberal to use post dilatation uh, with high pressure balloon. What are all the cases where you will select uh, rotablation, and what are all the cases where you go with uh, IVL duct column? I select rotablation only if I have difficulties to cross the lesion with a high pressure balloon, with the IVUS. Uh, if you have a difficulty to cross the lesion with IVUS, don't even try with a rotational attack, with a shock wave. You need to do something to prepare the lesion, otherwise the device will not cross. In some cases, you may have to use a guideline but uh, uh, most of the time, uh, uh, you need to prepare the lesion with rotablation if the lesion is very tight. And after rotablation, you need uh, some kind of high pressure balloon, may not be big, just a 2.5, but this will allow the lithotripsy to cross. So how frequently use the amazing technique in this uh, doing IVL? I would say about uh, uh, 10 to 15 percent, we have to do a rot rotational atherectomy. But if shock wave uh, balloon is not expanded fully at six atmosphere also, uh, what should be the next step uh, in your practice? Is it high ultra high pressure balloons or? Yes, your yes. Ultra, uh, if it's not fully expanded, we go to cutting balloon, high pressure, or very high pressure balloon. But again, uh, 
every time you go to with these uh, quite aggressive devices, you need to do IVUS and because uh, you take uh, some risk of vessel rupture. So be uh, very careful, measure the vessel size and undersize the balloon. Because when you go to this high pressure balloon, even if the balloon is, is said to be non-compliant, is never 100% non-compliant. So yeah. undersize the balloon half a millimeter. Okay. So if there is no question, let's move to the uh, second topic of this discussion by Dr. A.B. Mehta. Uh, sir, are you ready with your presentation? Yeah, uh, just give me, a, yeah, I'm ready with my presentation. And uh, here it is. And sir, uh, we will discuss about overview on calcium. Uh, so over to Dr. Mehta for your presentation, sir. Okay. There we are. Okay. Now, you see the prevalence of coronary artery calcification is uh, sex dependent and occurs in about 90% of the men and 67% of the women above the age of 70 years. How does it matter? It reduces the vascular compliance, it produces abnormal vasomotor responses, and it, it impairs eventually the myocardial perfusion. In practicality, in practicality, the first indication that you are likely to deal with a calcified lesion comes from the fluoroscopy. I know that the fluoroscopy is a very inaccurate instrument, inaccurate device to be able to judge the site, intensity, extent, and severity of calcification. But, but you should remember that in vast majority of the cases, we are not doing coronary calcium scoring or CT and geography prior to going taking the patient on the table. Therefore, your first indication will come that you are likely to deal with a difficult problem, namely calcification, only when you start the fluoroscopy and then go forward. Now, CT scan is the only non-invasive test which is far more sensitive to be able to tell you the severity and extent of the calcification. That's the only non-invasive test, in my opinion, that can give you some indication that you are going to face with the problem, which will not provide you either enough expansion or inadequate standard position. Therefore, we should modify the lesion. All right. Whereas the early, that is immediate stand malapposition or late acquired malapposition, LASMA, are not conclusively proved to be associated with MACE, but under expansion for sure of the stent is an unforgiv unforgivable. Calcium in a lesion with or without tortuosity is enemy to adequate deployment. In fact, those people who have been doing uh, CTOs, they would realize that in my opinion, calcification and the tortuosity is a signature to failure. All right, what happens? Stent under expansion is established as a major predictor. Under expansion results into instant restenosis, approximately in 10% of the patient population. Under expansion can lead to stent thrombosis. Under expansion can also lead to other adverse cardiac events like the target vessel failure. So the under expansion should always cause an alarm. Now, Calcium load assessment, as I told you very clearly, that your first indication will come mostly from the radiology, mostly when you do a fluoro or when you do a cinescopy and you realize that you are going to deal. The mistake you should never make is that to be able to assess whether the given calcium is deep or superficial, mild or moderate, amenable to just non-calcium debulking devices like rotablation or not, that I think is a mistake. Well, the, in an operator which is experienced and skillful, when passes the wire, does realize that he comes across the calcium, the calcium causing some kind of a resistance or comes some kind of a feeling that you are dealing with the calcium which is intimal. 
And there, I think, I think the threshold, as Dr. Colombo clearly pointed out, the threshold to modify the calcium in whatever way you decide to do should be very, very low. Because on a hopeful and wishful thinking that this is a simple procedure and I will be able to get away, sometimes can lead you to a very serious difficulty. The second way, as I said, is the coronary calcification is judged by city and geography. Well, what are the invasive methods of judging the calcium? Certainly, uh, intravascular ultrasound and also the optical coherence tomography. All right. Angiographic calcification is often classified as mild, moderate, and severe. Severe calcification, this is mind you, again, I'm pointing out to you, is a rough, rough estimate. And all these years, till we had, had the help from these modern devices, we used to perform calcified lesions, rotablation, and high pressure balloons and whatnot. So severe calcification is most commonly defined as radio opacity observed without the cardiac motion. And the moderate calcification is the radio opacity noted during the cardiac cycle before contrast injection. One thing is, when you see a trantec calcification on radiology, that means the calcium layered on either side of the artery, in all probability, you are dealing with a difficult calcium situation. And that is a kind of a case in which your threshold to do a rotablation should be very, very low. And as Dr. Colombo very rightly pointed out, the intravascular lithotripsy, IVL, is not the replacement, is not the replacement for the rotablation. In fact, it is a complementary device. When you have a calcium scoring of 400 and above extensive atherosclerotic plaque, there is very highly likelihood of at least one major coronary artery is narrowed significantly to result into a flow limiting situation in that particular artery. Well, sensitivity of IVAS is 90 to 100% and specificity also is very, very high. Therefore, intravascular ultrasound is a very handy tool. Like in Europe, where the use of intravascular ultrasound is comparatively much less frequent as compared to Japan, so is in India for the simple reason of cost, availability of the equipment, and simultaneously the training of an individual to judge the intravascular image accurately. Calcium is classified into quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. Anything that is calcified more than 180 degrees in the arc, or it has a length of more than five millimeter and thickness of 0.5 millimeter, it should be considered as a calcium, which I think you'll have to address other than your routine balloon angioplasty and stand. Well, when the calcium is in contact with the intimal luminal surface, you define this as a superficial calcium, the deep calcium is present when the media adventitial border are closer to the adventitia than the lumen. What does this mean? Actually, the most important calcium is the calcium which is superficial. Why? But that is in contact with your lumina. And if you do not expand, the stent cannot be deposited, stent cannot be approached, stent cannot be expanded adequately. A very deep calcium is actually in practicality should not matter. What matters is that you should be able to gain the lumen of such severity that it could correlate with the FFR of 80 and above, and that I think should be a goal. Usually, it corresponds with the luminal gain of about 90% of your different re dif dif distal reference diameter of lumen. All right, optical coherence tomography, it provides a higher resolution imaging and as compared to grayscale 150 to 200, and OCT may miss a very deep calcification due to insufficient penetration. But in practicality, a very deep calcium, as I mentioned earlier, should not matter very much in the, in the process of lumen gain. Well, calcified um, coronary artery disease should be treated by following methods. Rotational atherectomy, cutting balloon or a scoring balloon, orbital atherectomy, laser, intravascular lithotripsy, and high pressure balloons like OPN balloons. These are the six methods by which we can judge and modify the calcium coronary artery disease to make it amenable and suitable to optimal stent deployment. All right. Now, OPN NC balloon is a very good balloon. In my opinion, it's a very good device. 
and I think it's very handy. Fortunately, it is entry profile is 0 0.016, so therefore it is easy to entry, make an entry. It has a low balloon profile and it is double layered, so the rupture is not very common. However, when I have gone in 35 and above, in a temptation to open it fully when I have failed at that atmosphere, it has ruptured, not once, but twice. Fortunately, the balloon rupture has not produced injury to the vessel wall, so as to make me concerned about the outcome. Well, so this is the one, and uh, generally, they do not recommend to go beyond 35, but occasionally I have gone. Sometimes I burnt my finger, the balloon is ruptured, and sometimes it has not. This is important, rotablation. Now, we discussed, and the question was also raised, that when can we use a rotablation, not an IVL, or when can we use an IVL without preceding rotablation therapy? Well, this is available in four different sizes. You all are familiar with this, so I would not go into detail, but I might say at this point of time, very heavily calcified lesion offers so much of resistance that forget the high pressure balloon, forget the lithotripsy balloon, even an ordinary balloon of a small diameter of 1.5 might not be able to cross the lesion. It is not unusual, especially if you are dealing with a CTO which is calcified. And even without CTO, and even without calcification, very heavily fibrotic lesion might not permit you, no matter what to do, to allow the balloon to be passed, and even S1 is 1.5 millimeter balloon. In that situation, I think the only appropriate option left to you is a rotablation. Subsequently, you may supplement it by IVL. All right, orbital atherectomy has still not reached the Indian surface, and this is, unfortunately, we are not, uh, it is not available to us, but whatever I have read about it, that it has, comes in a one single size, you can only keep on increasing the strip from 80,000 to 130,000, and it fits in with everything. Whenever you want to use it in a larger artery, just keep, you can simply keep on exceeding the speed, and it is uh, capable of uh, doing debulking or retractomy with uh, this orbital device, and a time may come where it may, or fortunately, the particle size that it makes it is about two microns, whereas the rotablation has 70% of the particles, about 7.5 microns, and some are big ones. So the issue of low flow, slow flow, no reflow is far less frequent with orbital atherectomy. And we will learn as we get the ability to uh, have it in our, our armamentarium, and then we will know more and more about it. All right, never mind. Now, orbital versus rotational atherectomy. If the previously there is a stent in the target lesion, well, then I think rotational atherectomy is better. And if it is not, and if it is balloon uncrossable, then I think rotablation is preferred because how do you go about it? There is no way to proceed. No, then you have a choice, either orbital atherectomy or rotational atherectomy. I think that uh, anyone uh, who, who is... Uh, deeply involved in the interventional uh, coronary uh, treatment of interventional procedures in the coronary arteries should have good familiarity with the rotablation. It is not at all difficult. Maybe it might be having a slightly longer learning curve, but nothing is unsurmountable. All right, then came a laser. Well, I had an access to laser only very lately, very recently. There has been resurgence. Dr. Colombo will agree with me that the earlier with Nicholas Reinfart, which was in way back in 1991, where he had used the ELCA examiner laser and compared with a rotational atherectomy in high balloon and found that with the balloon angioplasty alone, if you are able to gain the same lumen as a rotablation or a laser, then the balloon angioplasty at the least restoration rates. Uh, laser uh, is one situation which you can use in a medium calcification. As you know very well, that it works also by creating vaporization, and there are three mechanisms by which laser works. Mechanism of action is breaking the molecular bonds into several ones, and they themselves make the lesion vulnerable. Localized thermal edges is called photothermal. It creates a thermal injury, and that also can helps you to modify the calcified plaque 
and finally photomechanical it creates a micro bubble and these micro bubbles have a very high pressure when they unite together they create a very high pressure situation and thereby cracks the calcium or fragments the calcium this is how the laser work important thing is that the laser can be used without any worry even in a thrombus containing lesion which i think in rotablation you may be careful because of the worry about the slow flow and no reflow let us imagine there is a situation of a pani where the lesion you find is very heavily calcified and the last stroke and last stroke is that the thrombus has formed to make it totally occluded artery in that situation perhaps you will find the laser is very handy well all right let us see well in eczema laser atherectomy the routine wire is good enough any wire will do rotational atherectomy you need a dedicated wire saline is the flush they use a rota flush which i don't think is necessary in fact um, in a uh, in when a in a laser you'll have a mixture of saline and the fluid and uh, saline and the dye and useful in calcified lesions which is moderately calcified in heavily calcified laser will not be useful in heavily calcified rotational atherectomy becomes the choice thrombus yes sufenus vein graft which i think is pulsatile it's pulsatious degenerated material and a no flow no a no reflow is an absolutely a wound when you use a, a, a rotablation and is contraindicated situ is useful but rotational atherectomy much more better much more better sometimes it has happened that in a non crossable non dilatable lesion where you are not in a position to be able to even change the wire there i think you can take a laser create some passage then it allows a small balloon to go into a totally occluded calcified uh, missing segment and then you change over with a rotablation wire intravascular coronary lithotripsy has very very rapidly started penetrating the indian market and that too because if it is versatility it comes in the diameter of 2.5 3 3.5 and 4 the length of the balloon is 12 but the emitters are separated from each other by 6 mm only so actually the clap clap modification or the calcium fracturing occurs within the range of 6 6 mm or maybe little bit here and there uh, maximum pulse count that it can deliver is 80 at the rate of 10 10 pulses per second it is compatible with six trench guide catheter suffice it me to remind you that when you are using 1.75 and 2 rotablator of 2 mm you will have to change guide catheter to a larger size either 7 or 8 well okay how does shock wave intravascular lithotripsy work number 1 the ideal catheter is delivered across a calcified lesion over a 0.014 wire and the integrated balloon is expanded to four atmosphere to establish the contact as dr chadda said that the contact is necessary and then there is an efficient energy transfer an electrical discharge from the emitters vaporizes the fluid within the balloon creating a rapidly expanding and collapsing bubble that might create pressure as as 50 atmosphere and it creates a generates a sonic pressure waves and the calcium is bombarded with these vaporized balloons uh, the, the 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 vaporized uh, bubbles and that can create a pressure of about 50 atmosphere the waves created as a localized field effect it travels through the soft vascular tissue selectively cracks the intimal and medial calcium within the vessel wall all right there are three basic uses primary ivl is in the when the calcified lesion which you have allowed the some other way possible to make the entry of the uh, entry entry of the 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 entry of the balloon there is the ivl balloon or you may have to do a secondary ivl therapy when intravascular lithotripsy after modifying the lesion with the help of a balloon which has expanded moderately and the finally a tertiary ivl where the under expanded stent due to severe calcification should be treated with a lithotripsy the success rates are 84.6 77.3 and 64.7% a very high success rate as you will see in the primary secondary and tertiary ivl lithotripsy all right 
safety, very, very safe, very safe. There is one great advantage that it will be very difficult for you to create a damage. It crosses the lesion and delivers practically in all the cases that Dr. Colombo pointed out. It has never happened to him that he has opened the IVL balloon and not been able to use it. It is safe. In hospital, mace is 5.8% with no D to F dissections, perforations, or abrupt closure or a slow flow and no flow. That I think is so reassuring that I think um, it gives us a confidence that at least I will do no harm and calcium fracture reducing the diameter and subsequent successful. Now, I have to show you a couple of cases where there has been a very limited choice and this is how this case is. Here is a patient who has a very calcified aortic sinus and look at the lesion, heavily calcified and markedly tortuous osteal lesion of the right coronary artery. It is taking an S-shaped curve. Here, forget anything else. Ordinary balloon also is very, very difficult to cross. Lithotripsy balloon will be impossible to track. And therefore, here, even with the inter, I would say, rotablation, one goes with an ultimate caution and with reservations, holding the heart and holding his heartbeats. I took the AL1 guide catheter for providing an adequate backup took a micro catheter filler FC wire, the filler FC wire crossed it, I had reservations whether I'll be able to cross with a fine cross micro catheter. Fortunately, the fine cross micro catheter crossed the lesion and then it allowed me to change the wire to rota wire. And subsequently, when you can see here, the fine cross micro catheter marker is situated somewhere here and there is a pacing catheter and then having placed the, the, the rota wire, and you see here, wide right artery to ostium RCA, the cannulation rotational atherectomy in the ostial RCA is difficult because it may look to be situated coaxially in one view, but if you were to take an RAO view, you will find that it is not coaxial. It is impossible to insert the guide catheter to RCA coaxially. And therefore, in this particular case, not only you should take the views in LAO, but also in RAO to make sure that you are appropriately coaxial. Rota does not demand too much of a backup, but it positively demands a coaxiality. And this is why this is important. Having taken this, I started with 1.75 bar after starting with 1.25 bar. The initial bar that was taken is 1.25 and subsequently at 2. Now imagine, my concern is that am I dilating the ostium or is the ostium is covered by the guide catheter itself? I am not too sure. But whatever it is, the later on, I made some manipulation to make the guide catheter move out and away and then change again the rota wire with a grand slam wire with the help of a micro catheter. And then I took, uh, pulled the guide catheter out, expanded with the 3.5 into 12 balloon and took a check shoot. The check shoot showed that the lesion was reasonably dilated and took a four by 20 drug uniting stand. You can clearly see that my guide catheter is outside and away from the ostial initial part of the ostium. That means they took an adequate precaution to cover the ostium and not to miss the audio, ostium. And this was the final result. Sir, we are running short of time. Can we curtail? This is the last slide. Okay, sir. Fine, fine. Thank this you, is sir. the last slide. The message is, A, you must know what to use when. You may be demanded to use, in one situation, a high-pressure balloon. In another situation, a rotablator. In the third situation, rotablator followed by a lithotripsy balloon. What matters is that you must achieve adequate stent expansion, which is sufficiently large enough to permit you an FFR of 90 and above. Thank you very much, Navin. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank, Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. 
and you know i was about to ask this how to deal the coronary uh, rc austere lesions and you have shown uh, very nicely so um, yes uh, calcium inhibits the circumferential expansion as we all know and you have uh, clear our doubts that how to deal the calcium if there is a mild coronary calcium you can then you have to use the imaging technique and then and followed by rota if, if it is more than 360 degree calcium or if it is less then you can go to the ivl if balloon not crossable if balloon crossable lesion is there so thank you sir uh, there are certain questions in the chat box can i ask you sir dr colombo wanted to make some comment he, he stopped when you started talking dr colombo well i think uh, a, a very nice feature which is unique to this technology is that if after implanting the stent the result is still suboptimal, you can do lithotripsy in an implanted stent. Yes. This is really unique feature because many other technologies are not appropriate to be performed after stent. So this is another added advantage. Yes. Yes, Navin. So, Dr. Colombo, uh, you have said that you can use the IVL in acutely implanted underexpanded stand. So, uh, I have already, uh, I have also used this uh, technology in two or three cases. But my, my question is, is it, uh, uh, if we use the IVL or uh, then can it alter the polymer and all of the stent? I'm, I'm not aware, I'm not aware. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't think there is any study that says no, but theoretically, I cannot imagine why should damage the polymer. But uh, I do not believe that we have scientific answer to your question. So your question is legitimate. My, Navin, may I make a comment on that question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. IVL works abluminary also. That is why the tissues which are behind the stent and which are preventing the further expansion of the stent can be also modified reasonably for allowing the stent to expand. Following IVL, you will have to use a balloon again to apply with high pressure to expand the pre-existing stent. Moreover, the, the polymer is situated and coated abluminally. And therefore, uh, it should not be, theoretically, I feel you should not damage it. Okay. Or, or they, they, uh, can, can we use the DCB after that? <laughs> a drug mm. coated balloon, I am saying. So, if you it are... may be, is, is a thought, yes, it's a good thought. Maybe, but I have no answer. <laughs> yes. So, uh, any panelists want to make some comments? So I think, uh, Dr. Mehta, thank you very much. And uh, now we will move to another topic. Uh, the next topic is when do I prefer IVL over Rota? And this should be this will be presented by Dr. D. S. Chadda. He's from Bangalore. He's intervention cardiologist uh, at Vikram Hospital in Vikram Hospital, Bangalore, with over three decades of experience in AFMC. He's a national proctor for several intervention procedures like tower. Rot rotablation, intravascular imaging, IVL, coronary physiology, CRT device, bifurcation angioplasties, left main angioplasties, device closures, and endovascular interventions. So over to Dr. Chadda for your presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Naveen. I'm so sorry my camera is not uh, working. So I'll sure. straight on go to the presentation. Fine, um, fine, sir. Fine. Okay, fine. All right, my slides are visible? Yes, yes, they are visible. All right, perfect. So uh, the topic which has been given to me is when do I prefer IVL over Rota? You know, um, we've had lovely talks by um, Dr. Antonio Colombo and Dr. A.V. Mehta, and uh, it's really difficult to, you know, share the same platform with the Stalwoods, but uh, I'm here to learn. 
And um, as the talk progresses, we'll have some discussions at the end of this talk as well. Well, uh, we know that calcific lesions are very difficult to treat. And that is probably because uh, invariably you will have a lot of calcium in whichever vessel you choose. So left main stenosis of the TVD is very common. You might have small tortuous vessels. Lesions often are undilatable, uncrossable, and it becomes very difficult to deliver the hardware. Now, plaque morphologies, if you see, uh, Dr. Mehta has already pointed out, you can have superficial deep calcium, and you invariably may end up with suboptimal results if you not prepare the bed well. And there are chances that you'll be compromising the side branches of the disease segments, and if you are not paying too much of attention to that. And patient subset is even more challenging. Invariably, um, you'll have patients coming with comorbidities. LB dysfunction is very commonly encountered because they present late. Most of the patients are elderly, as was pointed out, and the as the incidence of calcium increases with in diabetics in patients with CKD. And about 5.9% of ACS patients have very severe calcific disease. And we often get shocked when we discover uh, you know, under the thrombus is a calcific uh, huge plaque which is sitting there. Well, these are the traditional plaque modification tools which we have been using and recent uh, preferred tools for treating calcium. And recently, IVL has um, been made available and it's picking up well. It's got phenomenal properties and uh, which definitely help us treat these lesions. Now, the challenges with plaque modification with rotablation are that you definitely need additional cutting scoring uh, balloons. It absolutely does not work for the deep calcium. It's essentially meant for the superficial calcific plate. There are risk of having procedural MIs, there is, you can get into slow flow, no flow, and perforations, though rarely reported, or though rarely encountered, are a realistic complication with throat ablation. Well, the challenges with IVL are, it, it's a bulky catheter, it's difficult to deliver, so you need to create a passage for this catheter to get in, as was pointed out. If you have very tight lesions, balloon uncrossable lesions, first you have to create a passage because this device is about three times bigger in profile compared to the normal balloons. Yes, cost of catheter is tremendous and a common man cannot afford. And a developing nation of ours, it's even more difficult. Now, I'll, I'll show you some couple of case examples and uh, which will exemplify as to situation, clinical situations where you will prefer to use IVL lower road ablation. Let's look at a small caliber tortuous vessel. Now, this was a LED lesion. Now, we were quite surprised. We were not prepared to notice calcium, but this was kind of a very, very um, uh, heavily calcified vessel to our surprise. And as Dr. Mehta was pointing out, on angiography, you can pick up calcium, but the sensitivity of the CNA angiogram is about 36 to 38% compared to the imaging devices. And when we did OCT for this vessel, there was tons of calcium, which was noted in this vessel, as will be seen as this uh, image progresses. As we are running short of time, I'll just go on to the still images. Uh, all right, now. Okay, I'll go on to the still images. So you see circumferential calcium, which was present. And since we had dilated, we induced some dissections, we had caught some fractures. So, I mean, the vessel was completely studded with calcium. We were not expecting to see the same. Now, in small tortuous vessels, if you rotablate, you always have your heart coming to your mouth because it becomes slightly, it, it's a dangerous uh, proposition. So... What we did was that we went in with the IVL balloon and we caused fractures. I'll just play the um, still images. They, it kind of fragmented. And the beauty is that it fragments the calcium without causing dissections. All, the, all those thick plates have kind of uh, fractured. And the only thing which predicts good stent expansion is calcium fractures. Can everybody be mute, please? Um, is the dissections and fractures. There's a train going by in someone's speaker. Can you distract? Can you be mute, please? So there are fractures which were um, noticed. We post dilated and we got a very good result. So this was a small tortuous vessel and uh, it becomes kind of uh, difficult to chase uh, these vessels with rotabur. Second is ACS with a calcific plaque. This was a patient who presented with inferior volume. He had sir, completely occluded. We also noticed that this patient had some left main disease. It was mainly in the stem of the left main. We opened the vessel and uh, opening of the vessel amounted to... Uh, 
uh, you know, causing some dissection. There was concentric calcific plate. And there was thick plate calcium. LED ostium was absolutely clear and there was no plaque on the opposite side of the uh, LED origin. So we knew that if we do something here, if we do a crossover, nothing is going to happen to the LED. Left main stem had uh, calcium. You know, this was the situation which Dr. Hiramat was asking. You have a calcific disease distally, but you have a left main disease as well. What size balloon are you going to choose? In this given uh, case, we chose an IVL which was 3.5. It worked and there was a lot of white thrombus which was there. It fractured the calcium plate at multiple uh, points and we used the same balloon, the left main. It was expansion. Now, how it helped here was that the left main diameter was not more than three millimeters. Basic idea, as I mentioned, the impedance of the balloon and the was worked. Now, when you're doing IVL for the left main, there are certain points to be taken into consideration. It was a dominant cirque which started flowing well. We cannot do rotablation in these situations because IVL is preferred as lesion with thrombus. Uh, the rotablation is contraindicated. Now, size of the IVL uh, balloon is kind of challenging. So, as I told you, size is that for the disease vessel diameter. It's a pretty safe device. The only precaution you have to take is that you might have to interrupt the pulses, especially in patients with LV dysfunction, because if you do a prolonged obstruction, a prolonged uh, occlusion of the left main in patients with LV dysfunction, these patients can develop hypotension on table. So, give short pulses in hemodynamically unstable uh, patients. Uh, example of significant side branch disease in a um, uh, heavily calcified vessel. This was LED long segment uh, disease with a diagonal which was uh, coming out. We wanted to protect this uh, diagonal. So it was long segment LED stenosis with a significant side branch disease. Now, there are two things which predict side branch occlusion. The uh, calcific plate, which can cause the carinal shift or presence of plaque burden that predicts that this plaque is going to shift across the valve. So this was the diagonal ostium and uh, opposite the origin of the diagonal ostium, we had a superficial calcific plate. So we put wires in both the diagonal and the LED and we did IVL across the ostium. And as you can see, very elegantly demonstrated, this was a fracture. A fracture, the yellow arrow is pointing towards the fracture and the diagonal ostium remained as it is. There was nothing which happened. So we induced fracture in the uh, calcific plate opposite the origin of the diagonal ostium. And uh, we kind of save the diagonal uh, from occluding. So this is yet another way of demonstrating the usage of IVL, that IVL is pretty safe with an additional wire in the vessel, which is absolutely not possible while using rotablation. Because if you know that if you put the second wire while rotablating the main vessel, the rota bar is going to cut the other wire. So you need protection with either a microcatheter or a guide extension if you have a vessel which is originating uh, or which vessel which is very difficult to cannulate and if you really want to use rota. No such things with IVL. So this was the final result, LED flowing and the small diffusely disease diagonal also continued to flow. The major usage comes in undilatable lesions. We'll have two examples. One is of deep calcium. This was a circumflex uh, disease. This case was done live from uh, Manipal uh, Hospital. And um, we thought it's a simple case. And uh, we put in a balloon. So NC balloon showed dog boning. We went on and used a cutting balloon, which also showed dog boning. And see what IVL did at four atmosphere. The waste disappears at four atmosphere. And um, I have not shown you the pre-OCT images, but I will just show you thereafter, after putting the IVL balloon, we use the cutting balloon. So you have circumferential uh, cuts, which you very elegantly uh, demonstrated and the lumen diameter had considerably increased. There was luminal gain. Now the deep calcium, as Dr. Mehta was pointing out, is not visible on IVL because the penetrability of IVL uh, of uh, OCT is poor, but the luminal gain was phenomenal and this was the uh, final result. This is an example of an undilatable superficial calcium. This was an LAD. Dr. Manjunath and Jayadeva was doing this case. As was pointed out, if you have an undilatable lesion, you do rotablation. The lesion was rotablated. It took some time. And um, after doing this, he put in a balloon and see the dog boning of the balloon. The balloon just won't uh, dilate the vessel bed. So I happened to be there uh, and uh, we then put in an IVL uh, balloon 
and this opened the vessel and which was subsequently stented with very good results. So if you get into a situation where you have the routine, normal NC or OPN NC balloons not working or causing dog boning, four atmospheres, IVL is a boon to have in the lab. Expensive device, but it really bails you out. So it's an ideal tool for dilating thick calcium plate post rotor ablation. So uh, it, we know that in most of the calcific disease, we need combination of tools. We talked about under expanded strength. A lot of uh, uh, panelists here have had the experience. I have treated a few. This was an LED kind of CTO, which was opened with a 2.5 balloon and the vessel was stented, but there was residual waste and we were not happy with the result. So we went back and took an IVL balloon and we did the IVL and post IVL we did stenting. Now what I wanted to show the stent expanded very well with the uh, uh, IVL balloon in the stented segment and we demonstrated it very elegantly on the OCT. If you see the first image the stent expansion was only 74 percent and the lumen profile shows you that the segment of the stent is under expanded and in the post image we have the stent expansion going up to 91%. And on the same area in the lumen profile shows the stent is very well expanded. Uh, now, the only care here is that when you're using um, IVL, IVL per se, you must deliver at least majority of the cycles there because since there is stent scaffold, some of the shock waves might not go through. And thereafter, you can use, you'll have to use a high pressure balloon for dilatation. If you have two layers of stents, I, I have my doubts whether the balloon will work or not. Well, this slide was shown by Dr. Colombo it's from the Disrupt CAD3, unmatched luminal gain by IVL. No other device can give you the kind of uh, luminal gain which you get with it. 1.7 millimeters is phenomenal. And it, it, it does so because it is the only atherectomy tool which acts on both superficial and deep calcium. We have majority of tools acting only on the superficial calcium. Dr. Bhupati asked this question, where uh, do we, if we have superficial uncrossable lesion, rota is unreplaceable. Once you create a passage, then I think IVL balloon is unmatched. Now, head-to-head -head comparison between rota and IVL, rota acts on the superficial calcium, whereas this acts on both. Um, you may require, as Dr. Um, Mehta showed in his case, more than two burrs. You create passage with 1.25 and then go with the larger burr. But one balloon is good enough if you've created passage for IVL and it's going to really work. I always like to size the balloon uh, with the disease segment. Vessel dissensibility post rota, I told, is dictated by the high-pressure balloon dilatation that you have to do and you don't need to do such high pressure because you've cracked the calcium dissections are frequent with rota and that is how it works you have minor dissections happening i showed you on oct images that the lumen expands without dissections perforation periprocedural mis are absolutely not noted with ivr because you are not sending anything down thrombotic lesions systolic dysfunction and large dissections are a contraindication for rota we don't have any such contraindications in fact in presence of thrombus ivl is the ideal uh, balloon to use and the best thing is that the learning curve for ivl is really really short you we've all been using balloons you should just know how to place it park it size it and uh, you are there well, the advantages of IVL are easy to use. It deals with both superficial deep calcium. It's safe with the side branch uh, wired, and it avoids no reflow and intimal injury. And it's pretty safe in presence of thrombotic uh, lesions. Yes, it's a bulky device, difficult to deliver and expensive. At the end, I would submit that I prefer IVL over rota in uh, calcific diseases where there is thrombus in patients of ACS in undilatable superficial and deep calcific plaques where I've created passage enough to put the IVL balloon across in bifurcation lesions where I'm worried that the side branches might close so I suitably modify the origin of the side branch or the main vessel so that there is no carinal uh, shift in patients with severe LV dysfunction where you know, I know that the particulate matter which goes into the microvasculature can cause cardiac stunning or cardiac arrest. This balloon does not do that and it's pretty safe and under expanded stents. So IVL is the safest and the most user-friendly atherectomy tool which gives you the largest luminal gain. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Chadda, for your outstanding presentation. And uh, <clears throat> you have cleared the doubts where to use IVL over rota. And I think the crux is in deep calcium, in bifurcation lesions, tortuous lesions, long calcified lesions. And one most important point in your uh, 
uh, presentation was when you are dealing with the left main calcium and you have to uh, you know reduce your inflation time to prevent ischemia in patient with elbow dysfunction or in patient with uh, you know they who are hemodynamically compromised that is a very important point uh, i would like to uh, involve the panelist uh, dr samir dr nitin dr rajashekhar any comments from you from any panelist dr hiremat chairperson yeah uh, dr chadda i think it was a great talk uh, cleared uh, so many doubts which come to our mind and uh, uh, thank you for that uh, uh, the um, uh, I, i mean imaging from within like uh, oct or uh, ibis is probably a strong necessity in my thinking uh, before we use uh, make a decision to use ivl and uh, it sort of makes you confident that uh, which are the areas which are going to need more pulses and uh, probably uh, uh, sort of makes you uh, your decision very strong so uh, dr chadda uh, what is the crossing profile of ivl it is uh, 1. Oh seven, I think, or um, do you have It's any idea? It's point three eight and point zero point three eight, zero point four three for, for I think till about three and three point five is slightly bigger. And your normal balloons which you use are o o one three and NC balloons are o one six. The crossing profile of IVL as well as the cutting and um, OP and NC balloons are almost similar. Yeah. So yeah. and I I very strongly advocate that when you're dealing with calcified vessels. Uh, as dr hiramat was pointing out imaging helps because it grades your pulses you can grade and deliver i always strongly say that you should use a seven trench guider and you should always have guide extensions uh, stand by because pull push lot of times and invariably uh, the patient will have multi vessel disease and you should always treat the most severely calcified disease first because the balloon profile becomes you know kind of bad post uh, uh, usage so that delivery of the same into the other vessel will be kind of difficult and you need guide extension so always uh, when you have patients you must uh, uh, factor guide extension catheters i have um, uh, dr chadda so uh, i have a question uh, ivl is available for maybe for last two or three years and before that the lesions were existing same kind of lesions which we are treating with ivl with some kind of safety ease comfort whatever it may be were also being treated prior to availability of ivl if i ask you a question that i have rotoblated with 1.5 bur and i thought that i have adequately created a passage remember 1.5 mm bur of rota will not going to create a 1.5 mm of channel channel will be still smaller than that now you are putting a balloon and it has not opened at 12 13 14 what do you do what do you put, what would be your strategy in that situation because two things number one the ivl console is usually not available in the cath lab because of its cost of 40 lakhs of rupees and we order for it and many a times it is far away it takes about 45 minutes for the uh, ivl balloon to arrive in the cath lab Uh, how do you do and how do you deal with situation number one that and then when it was not available at all how would you have treated that kind of patients um very nice question sir uh, as you correctly pointed out we are doing plaque modification not debulking so what we are doing with rotablation is that we are making the calcific plate vulnerable to fracture two important things which predict the stent expansion as i mentioned are dissections and calcium fractures so if you have created enough passage for a nc balloon to get in you have to use the nc balloon at high pressures to cause fractures and dissections so the case post op cbg case which i had done along with dr cnm we did rotablation we put in a nc balloon and we saw significant waste 
now there was dog boning even uh, at very high pressures opian nc balloon was not available at the center but there was iwl balloon available we used it but what you raised is a very practical point if the iwl balloon is not available if you have an opian nc balloon you've created passage enough you can go with the opian at high pressures and crack this calcium so if you have no dog boning and if you cause fractures and dissections you have considerable luminal gain you can go ahead and stent and optimize your results i have another so thought yes you yes we were treating the these lesions sir but we were treating these lesions and we were leaving stents which did not give us the kind of luminal gain which this device is giving us so larger the lumen post stenting the lesser are the chances of stent failure so well well, well i'll tell you what i used to do sir. and which i might even do now or continue to do as and when the situation demands is this if 1.5 bar after using that bar i find that all right apparently by merely an eyeballing i find that well looks like it has modified the channel reasonably and believe me uh, dr chada it will never be 1.5 mm channel when you do it with 1.5 it will be smaller than that you take a balloon and if by about 12 to 14 atmosphere if the balloon does not give in or it does not expand i will upsize the bar now the question is therefore many times is a same time saving device i have dilated and used the balloon on the rota wire people have objected to that that you should not do that i have never repented never mind you might not do my way you might you can take another wire by the side and make sure that to dilate in this now the rota wire may be probably adding as a cutting balloon uh, device in addition to the regular balloon on which on the wire on the which you put a balloon so now you have a balloon wire and another rota wire by the side acting as a balloon if that does not open by 12 to 14 atmosphere there are two fears if i by get tempted to go higher and higher pressure rota bladed segment is little more vulnerable to rupture and the perforation of the artery than an ordinary balloon dilated segment in that situation one should not hesitate to upsize the bar make a little more debulking and then use the balloon but uh, you know i think uh, balloon under expansion is very important and uh, is something uh, negative and we should not accept balloon under expansion yes but sometimes even with balloon full expansion you may have incomplete dilatation because angiographically it is not always possible to appreciate if there is a focal under expansion of the balloon so don't always uh, believe that full balloon expansion means full lesion dilatation the other important point is that most of the calcified lesions have very thick elastic tissue and now recent papers are pointing out that when you rotablate you also rotablate the elastic tissue because they've done histological studies and found that in addition to calcium particles there are also elastic tissue which are there so this brings in the case for using uh, scoring cutting balloons and as dr antonio was pointing out you might have full balloon expansion but you put the stent the stent appears to be tapered and under expanded this is probably because you have not cut this elastic or fibrotic tissue which is there at the uh, site so it's fibro calcification so the fibrous tissue has to be cut and if you prepare the bed well the stent is going to expand otherwise you will have a tapered stent and this is more so in uh, when you are doing bifurcation stenting and calcified lesion in the side branch ostium despite going at extremely high pressures you will find that the stent at the end is slightly under expanded so i mean preparation of bed is most important whatever you might do whatever device you might use but you have to prepare the bed well before you implant the stent Yeah, but 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 Dr. Chada, I'm, I'm taking this argument a little forward, and that I'll say holds true for Dr. Colombo also to answer this question. That if most of the time when the balloon is fully expanded, we consider that an adequate lesion preparation. But if we have a reservations and doubt that it might not be expanded at some focal area, would that mean that every time you have done a full expansion with the balloon, you will still subject the patient to an interrogation with IVAS or any form of imaging? is that uh, is that uh, the rule that every time we will do that sir if you have started the procedure under imaging it is always nice to complete it no if you are not 
if you if you penetration not, dr chadda this is a pragmatic question absolutely Pen i agree penetration of forget i was penetration of ffr is also less than 10% in I, india I, I, and that and I, then, I, I then, agree, then agree. and dr chadda not to do an ffr is considered unethical absolutely agree yeah. absolutely agree right absolutely right agree. okay absolutely agree absolutely agree but if you if you got facilities you should do if you have, if you don't right. have, you don't do as yeah. simple as that as <laughs> correct correct i agree with you <laughs> <laughs> okay thank, thank, thank you, you sir i have a question so no, sorry yes, sir please. Please. So, I, no, no, please please nagend i think yes, sir yes, 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 yes. sir it's very difficult to take ivl rotablation i mean we are all living in india so i mean dr colombo is in italy so it's very difficult to escalate our gadgets which are relatively much much costlier in our country and how about uh, how what is the experience of you utilizing opn balloon if you are seeing dog bone with nc balloon that makes the cost at 20 i mean a kind of 10% of the cost of ibl balloon uh, this may not this question may not be relevant to uh, professor colombo however i think it's very relevant in our community so dr nagin i I think 90% of the cases you will succeed and it, it's like if i'm hungry i can go and eat out in a dhaba or i can go to a five star hotel <laughs> it, it is going to be dictated by my pocket so if you have an affordable patient who is willing to pay for an ivl balloon and he wants a safe procedure why not give him that but if if affordability is questionable opnnc is always there practice you know practice what is you you might be having something in your uh, brain regarding algorithm so, the way how i would approach so, so the algorithm is very simple i showed you lesions which are extremely concentric thick plate with the calcium thickness going to more i i use a cut off arbitrary cut off of 800 micron you know although textbook says that 670 micron you can use cutting balloons and crack it so anything more than 0.8 concentric more than 270 degrees of calcium if the patient can afford i always offer ivl if they are not willing if they cannot afford then opnnc works it it cracks the calcium and as dr antonio was pointing out you use slightly smaller size and you can go to extremely high pressures 35 40 and you crack and you get uh, fairly good results so i mean basic purpose of uh, a basic aim is to induce fractures and dissection cause dissections and they will ensure uh, expansion as uh, mehta sir was pointing out post rotablation you cannot go to high pressures because it can lead to uh, risk of perforation yeah, yeah. true and so that the most careful. important point uh, with the ivl is it is a way it, it generally uh, you know do a micro fracture of the calcium but not the native uh, the normal vessels preferential uh, you know fracture and the calcium it acts focally actually so it is not uh, with the uh, ultra high pressure balloons dr colombo what is the penetration of ivs in in europe all over approximately what percentage of the patient the ivs is being used in my in my practice i use ivs about uh, 30% of the time uh, in selected 30% that's the penetration in my practice in my country is less than 10% okay i think uh, dr mehta and you and uh, dr colombo probably get the most difficult sub subset mm. to you or by uh, simplicity of the uh, lesion the other cath labs can handle those so i think the percentage is expected to be high in your practice but i, I think overall in ruby hall which is just a cath lab which is going on for over 30 years uh, i think our uh, imaging is about uh, 10% yeah. population is also about 8 to 10%. So thank you and Dr. Chadda let's move to the another topic now so managing complex calcified lesion with intravascular lithotripsy balloon. So it will be presented by Dr. Ramesh G from Hyderabad he is a consultant intervention cardiologist at Yashoda Hospital Secunderabad. So over to Dr. Ramesh G. <laughs> Dr. Ramesh, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm there. 
Uh, just a minute. Let me get my screen on. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Small correction. I am uh, Dr. Ramesh from Hyderabad, but from Star Hospitals. Uh, so today, uh, uh, I will be apologies sir. This, uh, just to show, show how, how much difference IVL is making in uh, real world practice. Um, I will not speak much about the theory. I'll just uh, run you through a few complex cases and uh, how IVL has made a difference in our practice. So the first case is a 63-year-old lady. Uh, who presented with recurrent uh, rest angina and LVF. Uh, she has a moderate LV dysfunction on uh, ECHO, uh, fully viable myocardium, RVOs are preserved on the ECG and the wall, myocardial wall thickness is preserved. And uh, she has multiple comorbidities, chronic liver disease, Parkinsonism. Uh, she had uh, earlier post had been done earlier and uh, multiple comorbidities and uh, this is the angiographic picture. So uh, you can uh, see here, there is a, a tight lesion in this uh, ostium of the circumflex, densely calcified. And uh, and uh, there's a tight lesion in the proximal LED. I can see in this cranial view, there is a, a significant uh, lesion in the distal part of the left main and the ostium of the LED. Sorry for Sorry, I think this image is not coming. So here uh, we have a calcified uh, So here we have a calcified uh, double vessel disease uh, involving the left main and the uh, LED and the circumflex. And uh, she's a very high risk for surgery and surgeons have turned down uh, for the surgery. Uh, you can... Uh, sorry, just a minute. Some problem with my images. You can, you can go to the PowerPoint presentation mode, I think, then it will run. Full screen. Go to the slide show. Go to the slide show and play from uh, start and then full screen. Yeah, it's a come, sir. It's a come. You can go ahead, sir. It, it was okay, sir. India has achieved the landmark of 175 Yeah, it's okay, sir. Fine, you can continue. Sir, you Dr. can continue. Ramesh. The scene is not working, maybe, sir. But you can continue, sir. Sorry, can we do one thing? Can the next presenter uh, present it? I mean, meanwhile, I'll try to get my slides okay. I think. Sure, sir. No yes, yes, we can do that. If next presentation. 
next presenter is uh, Dr. Nagesh. Your slides are ready. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am ready. Are you? So, yes, you, you can. You can. Uh, I think. Ramesh, sir. You can stop sharing. Yeah. Stop sharing, sir. Yeah. Can you see my slides, sir? Yes, yes. So, uh, the Dr. Nagendra Bhupati from Chennai, he is going to discuss about the complex made simpler with intravascular lithotripsy. Mm -hmm. He is a senior intervention cardiologist at Sri Ramachandra Medical College, Medical Center, Chennai. Over 20, he has over 25 publications in his credit in reported international and national journals. One outstanding contribution in cardiology leadership, Mayan Award in the year 2019 and he is a very good friend of mine dr nagin over to you please share thank you sir thank you for the kind introduction it's a privilege to uh, be here among the stalwarts of interventional cardiology uh, let's move on with my presentation i will be discussing about three patients after discussing the evidence that has been shown by professor colombo and dr ab mehta i will be confining myself to uh, kind of uh, iv utility of ivl in these three setups one is native cad calcified a uh, calcified nodule and an ISR. Here is a patient, a 66 year old female who is a hypertensive, who had an ACS, non HLA, VCMI, good LV function, had an angio done, had an angio done uh, outside hospital which revealed triple vessel disease. Uh, uh, the other two diseases were, uh, uh, were in a small distal diffuse territories uh, except for RCA. This is the angiography of the particular patient. You can appreciate a, a kind of a calcified lesion in the distal RCA. And the lesion is also there in the PDA. Uh, the initial original plan was to do uh, intravascular imaging uh, using uh, ultrasonography and then stent the distal RCA alone. However, the IVAS uh, pulled back. We required both the uh, we did pull back from both the PLB and PDA, which revealed as a good sized uh, uh, PDA uh, with a tight lesion there also. We had thought of uh, doing provisional, a kind of knuckle technique initially. However, uh, after doing IVAS, we thought uh, it's going to be a diffuse, a diffuse, diffuse disease. Like we can't end up uh, uh, leaving the vessel like that. Even the luminal area in the uh, distal mid RCA was uh, less than four. So we need to uh, cover the entire thing. This is the IVAS. You can appreciate a good amount of uh, cal circumferential calcium. Uh, superficial only. We don't know the thickness of the calcium though. Uh, almost more than 300 uh, degree arc. This is the size of uh, mid RCA. The size of mid RCA was something around 4.5. Average of 4.6 to 4.7 millimeter. Uh, this is the pullback from IVAS of uh, PLB and PDA. Uh, we, we did a kind of IVAS guided intervention. Uh, it was a routine thing that we dilated with the 2 O balloon. Later on, uh, IVL, IVL was done with the 3.5 balloon to the distal RCA and to the uh, mid RCA. Uh, four pulses were deployed, were delivered in distal RCA and uh, uh, mid RCA each. We did a mini crush technique, it went well. Later on, another DES was deployed in the uh, kind of uh, trousering it, uh, overlapping it with the uh, distal RCA stent. Everything went smoothly. Uh, this is the case, and this is the report. And following a uh, post dilatation here, uh, this, is the, this is what uh, we got a kind of type 2 LS perforation. Uh, unfortunately, on the particular day, the, I told the I saw said the anatomy, vessel size is 4.5. We don't have a 4.5 cover stent on the desk. Uh, now I would request the chairperson and panelists, uh, how would they handle such a, a type 2, it looks like a type 2 LS uh, perforation. Echo patient is stable hemodynamically. And then uh, uh, there was no significant accumulation of pericardial effusion initially. However, later for 15-20 minutes, started having a, a slow accumulation of pericardial effusion. Uh, Dr. Bombri, sir, uh, um, and the question is over to the uh, chairpersons. I went only up to 4.5 bullet, went up to 16. I got myself uh, fired. Uh, Sir. Unfortunately, your slides are so small, I can't clearly see the perforation. Yeah, this is the site where I, the, my, you cannot see my mouse, sir. Yeah, yeah I that can see that. Yes, yeah, sir. In, it is in a two different angles, sir. Yeah, so what would you say? Alice is type 2 yeah, or 3? It looked like type 2 initially. However, patients started having slow accumulation of pericardial effusion. We waited for 30-45 minutes. During the 30-45 minutes, multiple 
attempts were made like a balloon occluding the vessel with a balloon appropriately sized balloon 4.5 balloon however uh, patient could not tolerate the ischemia produced by this we thought of putting a uh, micro catheter inside it and then uh, perfuse the distal circulation system however it didn't work so patient could not tolerate occlusion of the vessel this big rc occlusion after 90 seconds he started having a steel vessel impulse i have to open it up again if covered stent is not available uh... yeah uh, we had a covered stent 3.5 the ibus image what i showed clearly showed a 4.5 Uh, I mean, I know I wish I might have avoided doing it. However, already the equipments are inside. I didn't realize the vessel would have been four point five. We had a three point five, two point eight on desk. I think if a three point five is a liver uh, is available, and I, at this point of time you can put three point five. What do you say, Doctor Mehta? Well, there is a Navin. Uh, there is a there is a balloon called Papyrus. Papyrus, yeah. papyrus balloon is expandable balloon. It has a pericardial covering, and then it can expand from three point five to four. And um, uh, I totally agree with you that they take a if you have that papyrus, if you have a, a graph master, then I think that is covered with Teflon, and uh, that I will not. I don't think will expand too much. But I would still continue to say that. Um, Uh, 3.5. Take it and deploy it. Yes, and and if uh, in case you can uh, uh, deploy a four four millimeter of DES over um, uh, over this uh, uh, covered. Space. Yes, yes. Or alternatively, Navin, I have seen sometimes long ago when the call had shown one case that even an ordinary four millimeter balloon, a uh, four millimeter stent, regular stent, also closed. Yes, sometimes. Yeah, if if it if uh, you know if it uh, the that if there is uh, a plaque uh, that yeah. plaque covers the perforated yeah. site. Thank you, yes, sir. Yes. We thank you for exactly. concluding with what we did. Uh, the, even the expert ma masters agree with our thoughts. So we actually ballooned it. It didn't work out. We thought let's put a second DES. God willing, who knows? It may close. It didn't work actually, sir. This is second after putting second DES. It didn't work. Patient is still having a, a effusion. Uh, we thought, okay, desperately, the 4.5 was not available. Actually, was not available in Chennai at that point of time. We needed a 4.5 cover stent for this occlusion for this vessel to see. It was available only in a different city. However, it for to airlift it. By the time I thought, okay, let's send the patient for surgery. And before uh, sending it, I thought, let me try with 3.5 graft master. Uh, we deployed a 3.5 graft master. I mean, it it didn't work. Uh, of course, 3.5 is not going to work in this 4.5 vessel. Then uh, suddenly, one person from arrest or one for help, one one of my colleagues started reading the um, um, pamphlet available with Graph Master. That was the learning experience for me. The three point five Graph Master can go up to five, it seems. So we serially dilated with the four four o balloon, four point five balloon, and five o balloon, and ended up sealing with a five o balloon. This is what we ended up having it. So what I learned from this case is it is not how I, if we start with IVL or what. Be prepared with the appropriately sized uh, cover stand. On the same day, we intended that all four 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 point five cover stand graph master that ensured that these systems are available on our desk because we don't know when it is going to be required in our uh, on our day. So the learning what I had got from this case was a three point five graph master. Take a longer graph master so that it four shortens for sure. Take a three point five go, go. You can literally increase it to five. It seems as per IFU, which really worked in this particular case. So this is the second patient IVL in a calcified nodule. Uh, uh, I have listened many lectures by Salvas like Shadda, who I, I who who conveyed me that calc rotablation definitely doesn't work in calcified nodule. Then I reviewed the literature. I found that there's no therapy that is going that is beneficial in calcified nodule. However, we all know that this sub C eighty three subgroup analysis showed that uh, IVL really helps in uh, calcified. I mean, breaking the calcified nodule. We can review this particular patient's anatomy. 78 year old male uh, with prior multiple comorbidities diagnosed with Wellen syndrome uh, angiography done revealed that uh, double vessel disease critical LAD and a critical RCA disease uh, this is the angiographic anatomy these are all images you can appreciate 50% is in the proximal LAD this is the culprit lesion 90% is in the middle LAD extending with another 50% is in the distal LAD uh, tortuous a highly tortuous RCA with critical disease in mid and distal segments 
Uh, I mean, the, I thought this uh, torch was not in me. I need a be- get better support. Then I re- then went to try uh, drawing. Then I realized he's got aneurysm here with a 90% uh, uh, lesion in both biliacs. I mean, somehow we were able to get the long sheet all the way in. Uh, then uh, put a run-through wire, exchange it for a grand slam wire. Okay. I, I was could not be negotiated okay. initially. Hence, we proceeded with uh, uh, proceeded with uh, doing a uh, balloon dilatation. Um, having said that, some men in the IVL people say that uh, after two balloon dilatation, the IVL balloon goes. However, in this particular patient, it didn't work. So we have to upgrade it to 2.5 uh, balloon. And then following which we did uh, uh, IVL, a 3 OI balloon was utilized. We, did I, uh, we didn't uh, do IVS before doing IVL. This is the, after 2.5 balloon, we did an IVS imaging that clearly showed a calcified nodule here. Which is which is the which is correlated with the proximal LAD lesion, which is 50% lesion. There was no landing zone for the mid LAD lesion. I have to get my stent all the way proximally. So I somehow I have to break this calcified nodule also. We took a 3O uh, IVL balloon and then uh, d- uh, delivered a 3O pulse. We utilized uh, two pulses in the uh, mid LAD and uh, four pulses in the mid LAD and another four pulses in the proximal LAD. Whatever work it is going to make in the calcified nodule, I, I think the first case I attempted IVL for a calcified nodule. I didn't do an uh, imaging after uh, breaking the ca- after doing IVL. We went ahead with uh, placing stents. There was a re- reasonable expansion. Then we went ahead with placing a uh, regulating stent. So one stent from mid to distal LED, other stent from proximal to mid LED. And post dilated it aggressively. Uh, we since we know the size of the vessel exactly what is that the size of the vessel in the uh, calcified nodule uh, we took a 3.5 opn balloon went ahead to uh, 40 millimeter atmosphere i uh, for 40 millimeter atmosphere and this, we ended up uh, having a result like this this is the final uh, op- uh, final uh, in ivs image for the particular vessel we had a 85 percent expansion uh, of the lesion in the calcified nodule the leash the calcified nodule didn't break however uh, that's the point I would like to note here. I want to know the chairperson's thought of utilizing IVL in breaking calcium. If you look at this, the, tip, the calcified nodules are classified into five types. This is a type 1 calcified nodule, which is more, more common than all other type, uh, rest of the type 4s. This is the MSA at the tightest portion. This is the mid RC, and this is the MSA in the distal LED uh, region. Uh, so, IVL definitely works in calcium. However, data for uh, calcified nodule for for uh, in relation to uh, any other atherectomy device is meager. Only IVL has been shown to be beneficial in calcified nodule. I want to know the thoughts about the panels during the discussion. Uh, a week later, we performed rotablation. This time, I didn't want to burn my fingers through the groin. I went ahead with the. Uh, I didn't do an AL. I didn't take AL because there was a lesion there in the proximal RC. I thought I may dissect it. Hence, we took a JR and put a guideline all the way down and rotablated the lesion with 1.5 per. We achieved a reasonably good result. He's doing fine, uh, almost six months post procedure now. I also would like to discuss about the utility of IVL in ISR patient, which is not actually IFU suggested. He's a 72 year old male patient for whom I placed multiple stents have been placed in LAD and RCA in a different center. Uh, one and a half years before, he came back with ISR of our, both stents. Uh, this is the, uh, we, you can appreciate a tight lesion in the proximal RCA. Uh, the stent was uh, actually a little bit protruded into the uh, iota, so we need to crack the stent and uh, serially dilate it with the bigger, bigger balloons. And later on, we used a 3O OPN to open it up. Open OPN helped very much and deployed the stent in the uh, proximal RC. This is the final result. We didn't touch the distal RC lesion as the vessel was diffused. This is the RC following which we entered uh, the we entered the left coronary angiogram intervention. Uh, this is the lesion. You can appreciate a tight uh, 90% stenosis in the uh, inside the stent. It, basically, it's an underexpanded stent for which needs a good amount of expansion. After initial pre dilatation with a 3O, 2O balloon, we did a IVL using a, a 3O IVL uh, to the proximal LED and the mid LED. Reasonable expansion was achieved, as you appreciate here, in the proximal LED zone where the original ISR was uh, seen. Then uh, we placed two stents from proximal to mid LED and one stent from left main to uh, LED and then pot the particular vessel with a 5O balloon and we were able to achieve a reasonable a good results. You can appreciate the well-expanded stent both in the uh, orthogonal views. 
this says that uh, the instruction for use though doesn't say IB, uh, for I, ISR, utility of ISR, utility of IBL in ISR. I, I, I am relatively convinced that definitely works. I want to know the thoughts of the chairperson and panelists here. How do they treat calcified nodule? Um, which is a big, big uh, uh, kind of villain for all the interventionists. With this, I would like to conclude my talk. IV is the, one of the best technology available recently made available for in the interventional armamentarium. I feel the limitations of IVL include the bulkier balloon need a good preparation so that it at least enters. And 80 pulse is definitely a restriction, I would say. Uh, when they're treating a lesion from proximal LA to middle LED, Dr. Hirama said, clearly told that we may end up using two IVL, which is practically, pragmatically not possible in our setup. So I don't know what is the, why they have kept them up to 80 pulses when the peripheral balloons have got the 300 pulses. Long lesions, as Dr. Hirama told, uh, it's an operated choice. Uh, if it's a long lesion, I prefer doing rotobulation and uh, NC balloon, OPN balloon uh, before taking, uh, uh, before taking uh, IVL. I, having said that, if the patient agrees for the cost involved with two IVL balloons, I, I think it is one of the safest options to proceed with. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nagendra. Very, very well present all the three cases. And uh, you very well mentioned that, you know, eccentric calcium is a matter of concern among the intervention cardiologist and rotablation or orbital lethectomy has a you know, guide wire biased. So uh, over to panelists for discussion about the management of the nodular calcium. What is your opinion, Dr. Uh, Samir? Dr. Samir is there. Dr. Rajashekhar. Dr. Colombo. I think uh, calcified nodule and uh, intravascular lithotripsy is unpredictable. Sometimes it works, but is not guaranteed. It's not like uh, uh, 360 or 80, 880. So you can try, but uh, you may waste your money because it may not work. And it's still a problem, calcific nodule, what to do. So, Navin. Yes, sir. I will create a favorable wire bias and uh, take a rotor strong wire, extra support wire, and create a wire bias by adjusting the position of your guide catheter in such a way that your wire is biased towards the calcified nodule. And then attempt a rotation. <clears throat> maybe it works. Okay, okay. That we can try this. Yes. Nice thought, sir. And uh, after the Nagender's presentation, he, we must have uh, some adjunctive tools in your cath lab to facilitate the IVL treatment. You know, micro catheters, uh, supporting guide wires, extension gui extensive uh, extension guiding catheters, uh, covered stands of 4 to 4.5 millimeter. You know, so you, uh, anything, anything else in our cath lab to um, uh, facilitate IVL? Anybody else in their experience? Naginder, what is your thought? Uh, answer. Adjunctive tools in the cath lab to facilitate the IVL treatment. Uh, rot ablation, sir. There is only one tool which I still trust. If sir, nothing else goes with rotoblation, we don't have a laser in our hospital. Uh, otherwise, that could also be used. Maybe uh, if your rotor wire goes, that is our uh, Brahmastra, I would say. Okay. Uh, about the laser. About the other, you know, extension guiding catheters, uh, cover. Laser. No, no, I was just trying to mention about laser. Laser. Bupati, yes, sir. Bupati, laser is a good tool where the wire has crossed, but nothing else is crossing. And let us imagine that you want to change from that to a rotor wire. You are already confronted with a fear that if you remove this wire, you may have lost a totally whatever excess you had, that even you have lost. What people have said that you keep and wedge the microcatheter as deep as you can 
quickly remove the wire, ordinary wire, workers wire, and then pass the rotor wire. But there is always a fear that you may lose the excess, whatever it was completely. So there, if you have a wire excess, you can use the laser. And um, fluency 4040 with frequency of 4040 or 8080, and just create a passage, you can easily then change over a microcatheter, then now microcatheter will go and then you go to the rota and that's it. But laser itself, in a medium calcification is okay, but heavily calcified vessel, laser does not work. That's my experience. Okay, sir. Thank you, Nagin. Dr. Ramesh, your presentation is ready. Yeah, my presentation is ready. Sorry, it was running offline, but somehow I had a problem uh, when, when I was streaming it. No, no issues. So sh please share your slides. Thank you, Nagendra. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think this is where uh, we stop. Yes, yes. Uh, this patient with uh, multiple uh, comorbidities, unstable angina, had a significant uh, lesion in the ostium of the circumflex, very densely calcified, and uh, proximal uh, LED. You can see here uh, a tight lesion in the distal left main also, uh, again densely calcified. Uh, so the syntax score is very high, and the surgeons are uh, not uh, comfortable operating on this patient. Next. You can see the calcium in the running slide. It's it's almost like a stent. It's uh, it's a very dense calcium, and uh, this kind of calcium is usually uh, extending from internal to adventitial. So what we did is uh, we took an IVL balloon, uh, uh, three millimeter one. We dilated uh, from the left main into the circumflex. Next. So we you need to put your uh, slides sir on the slideshow, sir. Uh, it has come, sir. Yeah, it's come. Up. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. So we've done a. Uh, yeah, so we used a three millimeter IVL and dilated from left main into the circumflex, and uh, that's after the dilatation of the left main circumflex. The reason why we first did this is. There was a problem in getting the balloon into the LED, and we thought that the left main plaque is occluding, uh, is creating some trouble. So we got into the circumflex and uh, dilated. Subsequently, we went ahead and uh, pre dilated with the 2.5 uh, 12 millimeter balloon in the uh, LED, and then we were able to get the uh, IVL balloon through. And uh, yeah. That's the, that's the one. And uh, when we were dilating the left main part, we did shorter uh, duration, a uh, few pulses, five pulses, uh, instead of the 10 pulses, which we normally do. And uh, that's the post IVL uh, uh, to the LED. Then we went ahead and uh, put a, a 3.5 millimeter stent from left main to the LED. And did a pot uh, with a four millimeter balloon. And post dilated with a 3.5 millimeter balloon in the LED. And uh, subsequently, we open the extend the wires, uh, uh, open the stent stacks, and uh, using a tap technique, we extended the circumflex, uh, yeah, circumflex uh, uh, ostium with a 3 millimeter uh, stent, and that's the final kissing balloon dilatation, and that's the uh, final uh, uh, result. Uh, you can see a well deployed stand in the left main and the LED and circumflex. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get the uh, IVUS images out because of technical issues, but it deployed. A, it showed a well deployed uh, stand. So that's the uh, final uh, result in this uh, particular case. And this patient was doing well on uh, follow up. And this, I'll show you another case. Uh, this is again uh, a patient, 76 year old with multiple comorbidities, high risk for surgery. So this patient had uh, a densely calcified long segment lesion in the uh, LED, in the uh, right corner artery. And uh, there is also a, a bifurcation lesion, uh, 110 uh, bifurcation in the LED. Uh, and uh, distally down in the diagonal, uh, there was another uh, lesion.
Uh, you can see here, uh, IVL uh, sometimes difficult to get it through when you have a long leash or calcified like this. So we had to use a um, guideliner catheter. We predilected the uh, predilected the lesion with a 2.5 millimeter balloon. And subsequently, we were able to get the IVL balloon down. And uh, the rest of the thing uh, after the IVL, uh, we as the IVL uh, in the RC. And that's a long stand which is deployed in the right corner artery and optimized by post dilatation. And that's the final result after the stand in the right corner artery. And uh, we used the same IVL balloon. We, we used a three millimeter balloon here, slightly undersized for the RCA, uh, so that uh, we can also use the same balloon for the LAD. And, uh, this uh, we did a provisional uh, T stand. Uh, we did uh, with a single stent, uh, we completed the procedure with a stent in the LED, and uh, the diagonal ostium was uh, post dilated with a kissing balloon, and that's the final uh, result. This is the third case. So, this is, uh, this is a anomalous uh, right corner artery. You can see very high and anterior uh, takeoff. We used a JL3, uh, Jutkin's left uh, three uh, guide catheter. Uh, there was difficulty in wiring this lesion. Uh, protein rotor wire wasn't also crossing, but uh, finally we got it uh, through with a Fielder XT wire. And uh, we pre dilated with a 2.5 millimeter balloon, and uh, using a guide liner, we went ahead and uh, Got the ideal thing, and uh, you can see the guideliner which we were able to take it deep down, and uh, that's the uh, final uh, result in the right corner. Act. That's the final with that. Next case, uh, what we're going to show you uh, this patient actually had a stent in the uh, circumflex uh, artery. It was uh, under expanded uh, in the immediate post uh, procedure uh, period. It was a dense calcium. And he came back with an instant uh, restenosis. So, in this particular uh, patient, we went ahead. Initially, uh, we uh, pre dilated with a, a small balloon, 2.5 millimeter balloon. And this is the IVL. The I was basically showed uh, under expanded stent. Uh, with a dense uh, calcium which is extending up to the adventitia. Uh, sorry, I couldn't get the iris images uh, for the technical issue. And uh, this is the IVL uh, uh, initially. You can see a significant uh, um, residual there. And after multiple uh, multiple uh, pulses, this is the final uh, result. We still have a small uh, residual over there. So we used a non compliant balloon uh, subsequently to uh, post dilate it. And with the non compliant balloon, we could expand the stent well. And uh, that's the final uh, result. We, re we implanted another stent in this patient, and uh, this is the uh, final uh, result. Uh, so, these are the cases which I wanted to show. Basically, uh, when you have a bifurcation lesion and uh, you need to preserve the side branch axis uh, when you're doing an unprotected left plane uh, or uh, an LED diagonal with a large diagonal. IVL offers advantage uh, compared to uh, the regular uh, rotor ablation. And uh, in, uh, in, in patients where who already had a stent with under expansion, um, again, this is a situation where IVL uh, has an advantage compared to the rotor ablation. And uh, in situations uh, where you have calcium, which is going all the way up to the adventitia, uh, uh, in all the four cases which I showed, that's the situation. Uh, IVL has uh, clearly uh, advantages uh, uh, in, in, in delivering a good uh, result. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh, for nice demonstration of all the cases. Uh, anybody want to ask any question? Any comments from the chairperson or panelist? Otherwise, I would. Uh, I'm going to ask. <laughs> so, um, my question to all the panelists and the chairpersons: 
have they ever encountered tachycardia during ivl therapy can you repeat we didn't hear we didn't get uh, there was some breakage in the voice have anybody encountered tachycardia during ivl treatment this is my question theoretically uh, it is possible but i did i i did not encounter myself but a colleague told me that he got uh, like pacing uh, of the ventricle during uh, uh ivl okay sir. and uh, another case uh, occurred uh, diffused distal spasm which uh, had the difficulty to be cleared finally resolved but uh, diffused distal spasm and what about the uh, use of ivl in a patient with a pacemaker or combo devices or icds can we use it uh, uh, you know without any um, problem or uh, you have to uh, follow some protocols for that i don't think there is any contraindication yeah so i think uh, let's move to thank you dr ramesh and, and uh, i think the final presentation will be Uh, i will a boon for complex calcified lesion from dr dk barua from wizac he is a senior intervention cardiologist and director of cath lab and invasive cardiology at apollo hospital visakhapatnam so over to dr dk barua for his presentation my slides are visible no not yet Is it visible now? No. No. No, sir. Yeah. So you have to go to share screen and then share the slides. Yeah, I'm sharing there. Is it visible now? it is coming out so yes sir yes yes, yes. you can put it on the screen uh, so basically pop one yeah is it visible now yes sir yes sir please go ahead yes, sir. Yes. Uh, good evening uh, senior faculties and colleague thanks for this opportunity as already discussed uh, uh, by our uh, dr colombo and dr ab meta details about the ivl and other you know tools to treat uh, calcium and uh, ivl as you know uh, it is a very uh, user friendly and very convenient and uh, some advantages is that you know it uses balloon we don't require a lot of learning curve and it can you know uh, use the wave to you know rupture of uh, the calcium no distal embolization and uh, chances of reflow uh, no no reflow will be very very less and other complication like uh, vessel rupture perforations are very less so it is user friendly and it is very predictably safe and distinctly intuitive and consistently effective which has been already discussed so i'm going to show this case uh, in different uh, clinical situation this is a, a, a treat a left main disease this is a 76 year old hypertensive presented with a, a, a non st elevation mi with acute pulmonary edema here the ckd stage 3 and uh, unwilling to go for cavg you can see uh, left main as a bifurcation with a heavily calcified lesion and uh, it, uh, this is the normal balloon which uh, could not you uh, know it is a 3.5 mm uh, non compliant balloon which could not you uh, know crack the calcium and who is in that case 4 mm ivl balloon has been used you can see the waist has disappeared almost disappeared here and we have used almost uh, five pulses as you know let me if there is lv dysfunction we need to reduce the pulses but uh, this gentleman uh, this tolerated uh, 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 pulses and only thing that we didn't go to 6 mm what is uh, advocated after 4 mm dilation so we have stopped at 4 mm 
and that way sometimes you can prevent a rupture also. And uh, finally, we put a two stand strategy. You can see here. Uh, this, I use a mini cross because patient is unstable, and uh, because of the this renal dysfunction, I could not uh, you know use the uh, OCT in this particular patient. Finally, the acceptable result. Uh, patient actually was discharged, and uh, in uh, three months now, he is uh, doing very well clinically. His LV has improved, and even renal function has improved to almost stage two now. This is another patient. Uh, this is a very unusual clinical situation. Uh, classified uh, lesion with an aneurysm. You can see the, there is a large aneurysm in the proximal you know, LED. It's the 83 year old hypertensive lady present with acute coronary syndrome. She is a grandmother of our, our one a cardiologist. And her LV function was normal, renal function was normal. She has other comorbidities like scoliosis and she has COPD, also very short structure lady. And you can see this is the uh, no, kind of uh, tight lesion here with a large aneurysm. And actually, I was a little worried you know, how to go about this. I don't have any experience using IVL in uh, this kind of uh, no, clinical situation with the aneurysm and all. However, we thought maybe you know, uh, we try to open it a balloon. And you can see that uh, this is a three million balloon that uh, this uh, waste was uh, not uh, released. You can see that they could not crack the lesions. And finally, we use the IVL balloon, uh, 3.5 millimeter IVL balloon, which could, uh, you know, it was a little difficult to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, after we were opening with a 3 millimeter balloon, it was difficult to pass the IVL balloon. We have to use a body wire. And after with the body wire, we can pass the 3.5 millimeter IVL balloon. And uh, this uh, you know, particular lesion was, you know, cracked with IVL balloon. And subsequently, we put a, a 3.5 millimeter stand on uh, this uh, post dilated to 3.75 in and proximal part is a four millimeter. You can see the energy will regress. This is a drug eluting balloon. We need uh, we didn't use the covered covered stand because I thought the drug eluting will be more safer in this particular case. And energy has been uh, regressed in the immediately after putting a stand. This is after one year uh, that uh, lady was quite uh, comfortable. We did angiogram after one year. You can see that the uh, aneurysm is further regressed and uh, she is uh, quite comfortable. There is no evidence of any restenosis. This is a little unusual case uh, where IVL has been used to calcify the aneurysm. I think we could have a you know, good uh, you know, immediate result as well as you know, one year result in this particular lady. This is another uh, situation where real can help. This is a severe LV dysfunction. This, this is a 62-year-old man, diabetic, old inferior MI, with acute pulmonary edema, and LVA, LVEF was 24% only. And his creatine was 2.2. And L, he has got a, all arteries. Or LED has 100% calcified. You can see that uh, heavily calcified LED disease here. And uh, circumflex, this is the only artery which was uh, supplying, uh, uh, supplying and, uh, and RC also has a 100%. Uh, this is a lesion you can see here. Uh, this is a calcified lesion, it's a big vessel. So uh, even uh, doing rotablation, also in this kind of situation, there is uh, not too difficult, it, it will arise on the big vessels. Uh, we don't have a two millimeter bar, uh, one, uh, maximum I have a one, up to 1.5 millimeter bar. Second is that he has a severe LV dysfunction. So I think uh, rotablation in this kind of situation carries some risk. So we use the IVL balloon. This is the normal balloon. You can see that balloon could not, you know, uh, this uh, treat uh, could not uh, waste didn't disappear with a three millimeter balloon here. Finally, we use IVL balloon uh, 3.5, which could crack the lesions and put a stand. So this is immediate result, and uh, this uh, immediate result after putting you know drug eluting long drug eluting 3.5 millimeter stand and you know, uh, the, the post dilated to 3.75. And this is after six months. Uh, you can see that the six months result of after IVL in a calcified circumflex lesion. This is a quite satisfactory, quite good result. You can see the LED is still there. Uh, he, uh, he has a heavily calcified lesion. This uh, gentleman, uh, LVEF has improved to 3.5, 3 uh, sorry, 35. And creatinine has come to 1.5, 1.5, it's 1.4 actually. So he came after six months, we did the angiogram. You can see that LED, we could cross it with a CTO, we crossed with a uh, Gaia wire. This is the balloon with uh, no, a 2.75 balloon, which could not uh, crack the lesion. This is a 24 atoms with a body wire. The two wires are there, this could not crack the lesions. And after that, we use a IVL balloon. This is a three millimeter IVL balloon. You can see that the lesion was cracked. 
And finally, we put a long stem here, a 3.5, which is the post dilated to 3.75. Actually, we did OCT. OCT shows the good MSA. I am not able to show the OCT because of the time, time factor. And you can see the final result was good. Uh, LED and uh, this circumflex has been uh, revascularized. His RC is still totally occluded. I think uh, maybe later uh, later attempt we can try, but he is asymptomatic. He's quite happy and LV function and renal function has improved a lot after this. So this is one advantage of IVL that in a severe LV dysfunction where an you know, rotablation carries some risk with a single, only single artery supplying the heart. And that case probably a careful IVL with a, a, a disgraded or stage revascularization will be useful in this particular group of patient. This is a, this is another patient, the diffuse calcified lesion. This is our last case. I will show this is a 78 year old hypertensive lady and a hypertensive diabetic lady. She has the anterior wall MI three months back and presented with again uh, acute non elevation MI. And uh, this year, the troponin of uh, 400, troponin I, LVA was uh, 45. Her renal function was normal. And you can see there's a diffuse disease of the LED right from the proximal to the, uh, this, you know, kind of. This LED. I think uh, even we discussed with the surgeon, you can see the diffuse calcification as well. And there's an OM disease, RCA also disease, but it is uh, not very uh, you know, critical. And uh, 60% RCA diffuse disease. And OMs are small. So we discussed with surgeon regarding surgery, but uh, you know, uh, considering the diffuse calcified lesion right from the proximal to the distal LED, surgeons are not very really convinced to, uh, to be comfortable to go for surgery. In fact, even relatives are not really, you know, because they discuss uh, these things with other hospitals. They say, you know, surgery we don't want. So it is a diffusely calcified lesions. I think this is a little tricky situation. How to? I was initially a little apprehensive that the entire LED has to be reconstructed. You can see the OCT shows, you know, diffuse, you know, calcific lesion. You can see that, you know, every, various places about uh, almost uh, 360 degree calcium. You can see here calcium. And you can see that almost 360 degree calcium, superficial as well as deep calcium, because you can the very high calcium. Yeah, definitely, it will be more than 700 micron in this. And you can see here, so everywhere calcium. So we thought initially, uh, just a uh, distal, uh, distal part of the this uh, artery, we'll try to open with a you know, high pressure balloon. And uh, uh, probably I thought the distal art, a part of the artery will open with high pressure balloon approximately because it's a bigger, Bigger artery, bigger artery, we thought, you know, we'll go for IVL. So with this uh, kind of uh, finding, uh, we have uh, tried to open the distal vessel. You can see the distal is a concentrated calcification. This I tried with a 2.25 non-compliant uh, non balloon. Initially, actually, balloon was not crossing, two millimeter balloon cross, and we have graded, we have, I mean, gradually have dilated. This is 2.25, and subsequently 2.5, in fact, I used, but uh, this uh, lesion was, not crack at you know, 24 atmosphere maximum. I went to 24 because it's not, not, not uh, ultra high pressure balloon, is high pressure balloon. So, uh, subsequently, we thought maybe you know, uh, rotablation will be more uh, you know, uh, kind of convenient in this kind of situation. Maybe other option, maybe open NC balloon, but uh, you know, I try to put a OCT catheter, even that is also not crossing this lesion. So, I thought uh, maybe I have experience even you know, rupturing open NC balloon in uh, two, two, three occasions. So we talked with a concentric calcium, better to go for rota, rota. So as already has been discussed that you know, IVL and rota can be complementary, cannot replace each other. You can see that there's a concentric calcium here, and this is 1.5 bar at a 160 revolution. So we, we could cross entire uh, this uh, distal RCA with the rotablation and we prepared the lesion. You can see after that, uh, definitely this is better now with uh, you know, kind of uh, rotablation. And uh, this is after that, we have opened uh, with a 2.5 millimeter balloon at uh, no, 12 to 14 atmosphere, and we have prepared the lesion. So first we put a stand there uh, distally a 2.5 right from the apex uh, to uh, the, uh, this uh, proximal, you can see that right from the apex to proximal. This is a synergy stand, uh, which is very uh, good stand to you know, kind of negotiate uh, through calcified lesions, very flexible. This is 2.5 into 48 and uh, followed by 2.75 into 48. And uh, uh, subsequently, we approximately put another stand. This is 3.5 into 32 millimeter same stand. So three stands we put, and we have uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, 
before that, of course, uh, I should tell you that the proximal part of the lesions was done with a IVL balloon because uh, this is a big, a big uh, the kind of uh, this, the diameter artery. So we use a 2.3.5 IVL balloon. We have to treat the calcified lesion, the proximal part with IVL balloon. So rota and IVL port was used. And uh, this is a stent, a 3.5 millimeter stent. Subsequently, we have you know, kind of post dilated the stents right from the uh, apex to here. This is 2.5 at 20 atmosphere in the proximal. This is 2.75 at uh, 20 atmosphere. And from mid to proximal, 3 millimeter, followed by 3.5, and finally 3.75 balloon in the proximal. So, the result was uh, quite satisfactory with this uh, entire LED. It has to be reconstructed. There is no other go in this particular LED. And she tolerated the procedure very well. And uh, I think uh, she was discharged after three days. You can see that uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, this uh, uh, OCT everywhere we got uh, more than 5.5 MSA right from the apex to the proximal apex, apex to apex you know, at, uh, near the distal. It was around 5.5, then 6.5, 7, and here around 10 to 11. So we had a good MSA and uh, more than 90% uh, this uh, kind of uh, expansion of the stem. So uh, this is one uh, kind of advantage of uh, IVL as well as, of course, uh, rotablations where you know, uh, this uh, different, uh, the diameter of the artery has been involved right from the proximal to distal. Maybe distally we can use a high pressure balloon if it's not work, probably rotablation is the more you know, friendly tool for um, most of the interventional cardiologists because once you pass the rota, you can do anything in this kind of situation. So maybe distal part, you can do a rotablation and proximally probably because of that our large diameter, you can go for IVL. This is one example where diffuse, diffuse coronary artery disease can be treated using both rota and IVL. With this, I should say the IVL makes it possible to do PTC in different clinical situations with calcified lesions. It is especially useful in bigger vessels like proximal calcified coronary lesions and left main calcified coronary Another area I will help in preparation of the calcified lesions. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Barwa, for the nice presentation. Use of IVL in LV dysfunction patients, diffuse calcified LED lesions. Uh, anybody wants to make any comments? Dr. Samir. Dr. Mehta. Yes, Navin. Navin, I have, Navin, I have a question. Navin, I have a question. Yes, um, in an ectatic artery, where ectasia is due to vessel wall weakness, that's the usual mechanism of ectasia, the vessel wall weakness. If it is very proximal to a targeted lesion, is uh, IVL balloon likely to do any harm to the ectatic segment or uh, let's say ectatic segment is in the center of a ectase, I mean the lesion is in the center of the ectatic uh, segment. If you do the IVL, would that be harmful? So Dr. Barua, you are going to answer it? Yeah, I don't think a, a problem in the ectatic vessel whether you'll be able to you know, kind of get a proper size. If, it is, if you get a proper size, I think I don't think IVL balloon is going to harm the ectatic segment as long as it is calcified. So if you want to get the benefit of the IVL balloon in the ectatic calcified lesions, I think it is not going to harm. Okay. Because uh, this thing, as you know, that it is only just you know passing of the wave, ultrasonic wave, which will you know go to the soft tissue and you know crack the calcium. So it is not going to traumatize the artery. What do you say, Dr. Colombo? I'm um, yeah no I'm sorry I have to leave uh, I thought that this meeting ended uh, half an hour ago I have some commitment so let me say some final words on my side I believe uh, this is a breakthrough technology the only limitation is really the cost because uh, we would like to utilize uh, IVL more openly, but the cost is an important limitation. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's fundamental. Uh, there is no question that is not uh, a replacement for rotablator, is not a replacement for drug uh, for uh, high pressure balloons. 
but uh, is an adjunct to get optimal result. And congratulations, I saw excellent cases. Uh, you were really on the breakthrough of technology and intervention because your pathology is very complicated and uh, you are doing an excellent job. So congratulations to everybody. Thank you very Thank much. You, Dr. Thank you very much. So I think we are already um, uh, running late by 30 minutes. So we can, uh, Dr. Mehta, your concluding remarks. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry, I didn't participate yes. much, but I was listening yes, please, to. Please, please, please. Yeah. So my my apologies, but congratulations for a great program. Uh, I was listening in uh, um, through to most of the discussions because I got drawn into an emergency. Um, I have a question. Uh, we generally uh, deliver the energy at four atmosphere, or uh, and then uh, after delivering the energy, we go to uh, inflate the balloon to six, and sometimes we deliver the energy at higher atmospheric pressures also. I wanted to ask Dr. E.B. Mehta, is there any limit to, to which we can go and deliver the energy? Uh, you inflate the balloon at four or six or eight and then deliver the energy. Uh, is there any limit or is there any safety margin? Uh, what is your experience? Okay. Now, Samir, transmission of the intra-balloon pressure onto the wall of artery can only happen when the balloon is in contact with the artery. If the lesion is very big, 1.5 balloon, you can do it 100 atmosphere, nothing is going to happen. As long as the contact is not there, it has no meaning. Now, when the contact is there, we have seen time and again that when the dog ballooning takes place, the normal area is subjected to high pressure, disease area does not budge and you come with the proximal and distal dissection. The trauma takes place to the soft tissues. All these devices are working on principle of differential cutting. Rota, differential cutting. Even the pressure that is created by IVL, by the vaporized bubbles, is as big as 50 atmosphere. Same thing is about laser, very high pressure. So evidently it seems that the calcium or the diseased area which is uh, hard and not elastic and soft, can, can withstand the pressure at least as high as 50, which is the pressure generally created. And there has been not a, a really considered any, any, any significant incidence of a vessel perforation or so on and so forth. I also had the same question. Same thing is about radial strength. We talk time and again about the radial strength of the stent. Any stent whose radial strength is 600, and above is are all equal because the minimum radial strength that is required is 600. Rest is all a gimmick and I think is the advertisement propaganda or a sales propaganda. So answer back to your question again, contact with the heart tissue seems to me to be tolerated very well up to 50 atmosphere at least. So uh if it is uh, if it is one is to one balloon uh, to artery ratio and you are inflating IVL balloon uh, and the lesion doesn't give way, then uh, would you uh, go to higher pressure and deliver the energy? And if so, if yes, then up to what extent? It seems to have happened that uh, the six atmosphere is a nominal pressure size. That I think means a three mm balloon in a 3 mm artery at 6 atmosphere will establish the contact. It is a contact or hugging as Dr. D.S. Chada was talking, hugging the balloon, hugging the vessel. And beyond that, I don't think it will serve any person. In other words, if you at any point of time after completing your IVL treatment, think of going up to 12, which is a rated burst pressure of the IVL balloon. If you think you want to use it to dilate, then I think that's a serious mistake. So that I think should not be done. Yes, Akru, sir. <clears throat> if it is not going, if there is the dog going even at, the, at six atmospheric pressure of IVL, I think you can use the ultra high pressure balloon after that. That may be the uh, next step. 
I think, uh, Davina, we, we have completely run out of time. Yes, sir. And, yes, sir. Uh, so, um, concluding. so uh, you are concluding remarks, sir? Uh, my, my concluding remark is like this, that years ago, uh, we underwent evolution of how to treat uh, calcium, uh, calcium studded lesions. Initially, it was a root ablation and balloon angioplasty only. Later on, we started getting root ablation and high pressure balloons. Later on, we started using high pressure balloons alone. And then now, ultimate in um, uh, uh, calcified uh, hard lesion is uh, uh, intravascular lithotripsy. So we have evolved and we have learned how to use the combination of all the available devices to our advantage so as to ultimate bottom line is this ideal and optimal stent apposition and expansion that is the moral you achieve it by whatever you want to ultimate goal is that and i think this all these instruments wisely used judiciously used appropriate skillful combination of various devices ultimately aims at achieving a totally optimized stent apposition and stent expansion. That is the bottom line. Thank, thank you very much, sir. And uh, I would like to thank all, all the uh, speakers, chairpersons, panelists, uh, and very nice presentation. And th very thanks to Translumina for organizing such a nice webinar on IVL. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Thanks to all of you, sir. Thank, thank you.